to uh, good evening everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to our uh, third webinar of the year. Uh, my name is Sara Fusula and I should inform you that the video uh, is being recorded. Uh, our speaker for today is a uh, professor, drilling engineering expert, and energy consultant, Kilsidis Vasilios. And the title of today's webinar is Man of Pressure Drilling, Successful Techniques to Drill Difficult Wells, Particularly in Deep Waters. Uh, professor Kilsidis, thank you very much for uh, being here with us today with uh, such an interesting topic. Um, also, I would like to thank our faculty advisor, uh, the assistant professor, uh, Yotz, for the whole effort. Now, uh, Leroy, uh, could you tell us some things about our uh, speaker? Of course. Good evening, everyone. So, Professor Vasilis Kelisidis is a drilling engineering expert and an energy consultant, a Greek citizen residing in Hania, Greece, who provides top training and research services. He served as the department chair and professor of petroleum engineering department at Khalifa University in Abu Dhabi. From August 2012 to August 2015, he was professor at the Petroleum Engineering Program at Texas A&M at Qatar, where he served as program chair in 2012-2014. Between 2000 and 2016, he was professor of drilling and engineering and fluent mechanics in the Mineral Resource Engineering School of the Technical University of, Greece, of Crete in Greece. He was a Society of Petroleum Engineers Distinguished Lecturer from the period 2019-2020. Professor Kelesidis has worked during the period from 1986 to 1994 with different Schlumberger companies, who is the world's largest oil service company in Houston, USA, France, and England. In, in England. Addressing challenges on drilling engineering, drilling fluids, surface logging, key control, semantic operation, and drilling hydraulics. During the span of his 30 plus year career, career in the upstream oil and gas industry around the world, he has performed research both as industry professional and as an academic on various challenges faced by the industry regarding flow phenomena related to oil and gas exploration and production. He has published uh, 73 research results at, at conferences and 52 highly rated academic journals. Currently, he stands with 3,200 uh, plus citations with a Google Scholar H index of 32 and the Scopus H index of 27. Professor Kelesidis is included in the list of Stanford University of top 2% of the career long scientists with the greatest citation impact up to 2019 and 2020, and of top 2% of the scientists who had the greatest citation impact in 2019 and 2020. Professor Kelesidis has a PhD from University of Houston, a Master's of Oregon uh, State University, and a diploma from the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki in Greece. All this in chemical engineering. Now let's move on to the main event. Dr. Kelesidis, the stage is yours. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, all of you, for coming to this presentation. I would like to thank the SPE student chapter of Technical University of Crete uh, for, this, uh, active, for their activities. And in fact, they've been doing an excellent job uh, in the past uh, years and also congratulate their uh, professor advisors. And I would like to thank you all for attending this seminar. So let's start. Okay, I hope you all see my screen. Is okay? Yes, yes. Okay, the title is Manus Pressure Drilling. Uh, just a few things about myself, as uh, Mr. Zumarakis uh, mentioned before. I have the degrees all in chemical engineering from Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, Oregon State University, and University of Houston. Then I joined Slumbers the Companies. I moved in Houston, sent it here in Cambridge, working on drilling and pumping. I then joined Technical University of Crete here, Mineral Resources Engineering. Since 2000, uh, we've been living here, uh, doing research 
and teaching drilling and fluid mechanics. I was for three years a professor and a chair for two years of petroleum engineering department at Texas A&M in Qatar. And then in 2016, 17 and 18, two years as professor and department head of petroleum engineering at Khalifa University in Abu Dhabi. And Abu Dhabi is the fourth largest producing oil company, uh, oil producing state in the world. So a brief summary of my presentation. I will have a brief introduction to hydrocarbon exploration and drilling. We will look into the reasons for manus pressure drilling and do very little theory behind the MPD manus pressure drilling. We will discuss the equipment of MPD. Then we will analyze MPD techniques, we have uh, some different ones uh, and present you some applications from case studies as they were published in uh, SPE papers. Finally, I will close with the future of drilling and a final note on deep water drilling in Greece. So why drilling more wells? Well, we can answer this question by looking at the history and the projections for world production and world consumption. Blue is world production, uh, uh, brown is world consumption. They go hand in hand. And uh, we see a small inc increase over the years, about two to 3%. Then around 2020, we had a big drop because of the pandemic and then they recovered and the forecast now goes uh, again increasing. Interesting to compare the forecast back in 2018 about before the pandemic, how it would go. And as you can see, we do see now a forecast in 2022 and beyond similar uh, increase. What is important to note here is that current state of production, liquid fuel production, oil and equivalent gas in uh, oil equivalent is, is around 100 bar million barrels per day. That's a huge number. And it's good to compare current state of production with past production. And I found this curve starting from 1930, but around 1980, we were about 60 million barrels of oil per day. 2010, went to 70 million barrels per day, and currently we are 100 million barrels per day. This is the reason we do need to drill more wells, and we need to do that uh, with safety. So what is really involved in drilling and finding oil. I found this cartoon and I thought it would be very nice to share it with you. Really, it's we go out to the sea, we find some oil, we drink a big hole and bingo, we can make money. Of course, it's not that simplified. And I guess the people attending the presentation are a bit uh, curious whether the objectives are really simple. But in principle, this is what we have to do. Where is this oil is coming from? And for this, I would like to share with you what we call the hydrocarbon resource triangle. And in terms of price for discover for exploitation, it's increasing price going down. And we need better technology as we go down. So in the past, we had what we were calling conventional reservoirs, smaller volumes, easy to develop. Then we went to unconventional resources, and this is the present, where we had low permeability, gas shales, heavy oil, in the future, uh, potential resources, we indicate here gas hydrates, oil shale, which we already 
exploit it, but gas hydrates could be the resource of the future. Huge deposits all around the world, and in fact, we do have also gas hydrates uh, just outside uh, Castel Horizon. And uh, good for you to know that uh, the team of Professor Nico, Nikos Varotis with Dimitris, Dr. Dimitris Marinakis were members of a big European team that they search these gas hydrates in uh, offshore Castel Horizon. Are the fossil fuels coming to an end? This is a question that we keep hearing, and I would like to answer this with this cartoon, how the cartoonist thought that the life without fossil fuels may be. And certainly I share his view. I'm a firm believer that uh, the future of fossil fuels, uh, it continues to be good, not only in the short term, but also in the medium and the long term. Of course, we need to identify and utilize all energy sources. And this cartoon, I think, depicts this, uh, this thinking. Yes, we may be looking deep underground for hydrocarbon resources, but if I can exploit the sun, uh, I should be able to do that, and I should do that, and I, I think Greece is doing very well uh, in that respect. Of course, we should do that, not sacrificing agricultural land. Unfortunately, this is happening, and this is not good. Currently, we, li we live through the state of high gas prices, and I hope we will not run into a situation like this, uh, that we need to break the glass and uh, use uh, the bicycle only because the gas prices are, uh, are very, very high. Now, we need to drill more wells, and for this, we need to look into the oil price. So I took a, a, a snapshot of the past five years of the oil price, and between 2017 and 2020, it was a good price, I, I call it, between 60 to $70 a barrel of oil. And I, I call this a good price because uh, oil companies were making good money, so they were investing money to search for more hydrocarbons, and the world, the consumers, could sustain such a price. And that uh, was shown because the, the price uh, went like this for quite a few years. Then we had the pandemic and we had a huge drop in the price because there was no, not much uh, demand. And interestingly enough, there was a very short period, I think of less than a week, that we had negative price of oil. This is something that oil never sees to amaze us about the price fluctuations. I have never seen negative price for oil meaning that the producers were paying the, cons the consumers uh, money in order to get their oil. And there are explanations for that. In any case, the price recovery went back to $40 a barrel. And now that the economy is going much better in, around, around the world, because we do see the end of the pandemic, we see a price increase and it's less than almost a year, it, go, it went from $40 to $100 a barrel. And then um, unfortunately we had the war at the beginning of this year that took the price hike to $123 a barrel and now it's hovering around $100 a barrel. Good to know how much does it cost to produce a barrel of oil? And I found this information from CNBC some time back, and it gives you an idea, a range of prices. How much does it cost in different parts of the world to produce a barrel of oil? And of course, this will dictate the price of oil, but also who will continue to look for oil. And we see now uh, 
uh, with unconventional resources in the in the states, the price is around 40 to 70, 80 dollars a barrel. Uh, in Brazil, deep water Brazil, it's 70 dollars plus a barrel. Nigeria, 20 to 40 dollars. And of course, the champion is Saudi Arabia, where we have less than $10 a barrel to produce, on the average, to produce uh, a barrel of oil. And I would like to share with you, when I was in Abu Dhabi, and from a presentation of uh, uh, ADNOC, Abu Dhabi National Oil Company, I mean, they revealed that their cost for producing a barrel of oil, on the average, was a bit under $4 a barrel. So imagine if there is a $70 a barrel uh, sale price, how much money these oil companies make. Now let's focus on drilling. And uh, to start this presentation, I would like to look at a few golden rules in drilling. And I started with a cartoon that we always, we should always remember the golden rule. What's that? Whoever has the gold makes the rules. In fact, I'm kidding. The first one is that whoever searches find, finds, whoever does not dig or search will never find. This is a paraphrase of a phrase of Pythagoras that we need to search in order to find something. And this is very true for finding hydrocarbon resources. We rely on our very good geoscientists and petroleum geologists to identify the prospects and the places where we need to drill and make a hole in the ground. But until we make a hole in the ground and reach the, the, the rock strata where hydrocarbons may be present, we will never know whether we do have hydrocarbons or not. Additional golden rules. First one, oil is where you find it. Over the years, the geoscientists identified uh, standard ways of finding hydrocarbon resources. But many times people have found hydrocarbons in bizarre places, places where they didn't expect. And the message here is, that oil is where you find it. So when you look for resources, you should always think outside the box. And a perfect example of this, I would say, is uh, what you may be hearing many times about the Zor find and the Zor field offshore Egypt. For years, Shell had the licenses to look for hydrocarbons in that area. They couldn't find the hydrocarbons. Then they sold their licenses, and the Italians, ENI, bought the licenses, and they look at in a deep, from a different way, a different perspective, and they found the huge uh, deposits. Then another rule for drilling now is that if it ain't turning, it ain't earning. This is America say if it does not turn the bit you will not earn its money. It means that we need, as drilling engineers, we need to provide every resource and ensure that our bid will continuously turning. Otherwise, it will be, we will be losing money, but also we will be jeopardizing safety. This is what we call the non-productive time. So we need to ensure that the bid continuously turns, and the techniques that we will discuss, MBD techniques, will help us do, do that. And finally, this is my most favorite one, uh, a saying from Jean-Paul Getty, founder of the Getty Oil Company. Uh, you are not uh, that old, you may not have heard it, Getty Oil Company, but uh, Jean-Paul Getty was the richest American alive in 1957. His formula for success, rise early, work hard, strike oil. So in order to drill wells, we use onshore uh, rigs. And this is a picture from the 
last land rig that we had in operation in Greece back in 2002. And we were fortunate enough that we went there with my students and we saw that that was a Doita uh, rig. It, they it went down to 4,000 meters. Unfortunately, they didn't find anything. And then we have the offshore rigs. And primarily we have in shallow waters, Jacob rig, and then in deep waters, this is the type of rigs that we may see offshore or deep waters in Greece, a semi-submersible rig and a drill ship. And here I indicate the, the range of waters, water depth that they can operate, they can go up to 3,000, 3,700 meters. The, rig cost, the drill ship costs around $800 million and the wells here, they cost anywhere between 80 to $100 million. Now, we should always remember that drilling is a balancing act. We need to balance, and I will explain that briefly later, but it's a balancing act that requires teamwork. Just a couple of words about how do we uh, perform drilling, the drilling process. So we use a bit and we apply weight with some heavy old, uh, drill pipe. And then we have sections of drill pipe connected to the surface. So we apply weight and rotation. And by doing so, we crush the rock. During that time, continuously, we circulate drilling fluid inside the drill pipe, outside the bit, and it's coming back up into what we call annulus, tearing the drill uh, cuttings to the surface. And for drilling a well, reaching a target, for example, here at 25,000 feet, about 8,000 meters, we drill a telescopic hole, what we call it. This is a well plan, what we indicate that we would be doing before we start drilling. So we start with a bigger hole, and then as we move deeper, for different reasons, and primarily to balance the pressures of the fluids inside uh, in the rock, we use different diameters. And as we move deeper, we use uh, smaller diameters. So it's important, these are the parameters that we need to take into account is the depths. And I will focus here on the pore pressure, the fluid pore pressures, and the rock frac pressures. Now, what is the driller's worst nightmare? It's this, what we call a blowout. That means we have uncontrolled flow of hydrocarbons. And the most dangerous ones are the gases that they get into our well, and then somehow they make their way to the surface, they ignite, and they, the rig uh, gets on fire. And here we may have loss of life and of, of the rig. This is an example of a, a blowout back in 2012 in Oklahoma, where they drilled into a shallow gas pocket. At the very beginning of drilling, there were around 300 meters of drilling. We do put protective equipment in order to avoid this, as we will see shortly, but it was at the beginning, the equipment was in place, but they didn't manage to put it uh, at the time that they had the accident. Fortunately, in this one, uh, no injuries were reported. So I think, yeah, I need to go. Of course, we have the most tragic accident in the history of oil and gas exploration. That was the Macondo well, the deep water horizon semi-submersible rig. And about 12 years ago, April 20, 2010, it caught fire and then the rig sank and 11 lives were lost and we had huge uh, environmental disaster in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, 
Curiously enough, it happened after they have finished drilling, after they have put cement, and they were preparing to abandon the well. And then through a series of events, uh, they really got fired. Now, this happens when we have a kick, that means an influx of subsurface fluids into the wellbore. If we don't have a control, then this may lead to a blowout. So this is a, a schematic of an actual, uh, what we call conventional drilling. So I have the bit and the drill pipe. So I'm circulating uh, fluid down hole and then it comes up to the surface and then it goes through uh, cleaning equipment uh, for the solids and then it returns back to the well with the mud pumps. Now in normal drilling operation, this is an open system. And when a kick occurs, this is the sudden influx of fluids from the formation into the well board. And we call it a kick because it displaces some fluid from the well board and it feels like a kick. And this is the kick fluid. Now this has to be circulated out. In a normal situation, this is open. And if, if I don't have my protective equipment, which are what we call blowout preventers, BOPs, then I, I will be run into problems. What are the BOPs? These are series of valves. And here they are depicted uh, with red color. On top of the well, this is a land rig. And in fact, this was one of my first pictures back in 1986 when I joined Anadril in South Texas. And I was taking pictures to see what, what they look like underneath the rig because the project we were doing. So I have this series of valves, uh, color yellow. The top one, which is the bigger one, it, uh, we call it an annual, annular preventer and it's always the last one. And above this, there is a, a T, a pipe with a T, and the fluid that has come back, it returns to the uh, mud, mud pits. Now through here, I have the drill pipe and this is the rig floor. So this is open. And to the right, I show you different configurations of the different valves that we have. That, what we call a BOP stack. And on top, there is always the annular preventer. Now, why does a kick occur? Just very briefly, this is my drill pipe. This is my bit. I'm circulating fluid down hole and up hole. I have a formation that I'm drilling. It contains hydrocarbon fluids or water. They have a pressure. We call this pressure formation pressure designated P sub F. Using my drilling fluid and pumping this fluid, I apply pressure, which we call it at the bottom hole PW. Now, I have a kick when my pressure in the well bore is smaller than the pressure of the formation of fluids. Conversely, it may happen that the pressure in the borehole PW can be greater than the fracturing pressure of the formation of the rock. If this happens, then I may create a fracture and I may be losing fluid. This is a loss. Both of them are equally uh, important and it can be detrimental to the safety of the well. So me as a driller, I have to juggle I have to balance between these two pressures. And this is very important to understand because this is everything behind the theory and the development of Manas pressure drillings. I have to juggle between pressure of the formation of fluids and fracturing pressure of the rock. And I depict this in a, what we call a depth pressure diagram. And this is a theoretical case so my lower limit is my pore pressure. I indicate that with the red line, that's P sub F. My upper limit 
is the fracture pressure P sub FF, the blue line. And I have to ensure when I'm drilling a well and I'm circulating that my pressure is within these limits. This is what we call drilling window. And I have to juggle between these two limits. So what are the, the, the steps for a kick? I may have an indication of a kick and I can detect, then I can detect it, confirm that I have a kick. I need to contain it, meaning that I have to stop any influx of fluids. I need to remove these fluids. As, if, as they enter the wellbore, they cannot stay there. I need to remove them. And then I need to place a different fluid, different drilling mud with higher density in order to continue drilling. Now, what manus pressure drilling allows the driller to do is to have improved procedures for doing all these steps. Because kicks do happen. They happen very often. Now, we need to make sure that we control them. Blowouts, which is the uncontrolled influx and undetected influx of kick, they are rare, but they happen. And this can lead to, uh, to loss of life and uh, disaster. So now is the time to define what is minus pressure drilling, in short, MPD. And this is the definition from the International Association of Drilling Conductors, MPD Committee. MPD is an adaptive drilling process used to more precisely control the annular pressure profile throughout the wellbore, not only at the bottom hole, but throughout. The, objective, uh, the objectives are to ascertain the downhole pressure environment limits and to manage the annular hydraulic pressure profile. So MPD is a general description of methods for wellbore pressure management. It includes techniques, and the equipment, I need to equipment that normally I don't have in conventional drilling to limit well kicks, lost circulation. This is what we call lost circulation when I'm losing fluids into the formation and differential pressure streaking, sticking. And it may happen that we can reduce some casing strings required to reach total depth. And this has some very positive implications. So manus pressure drilling as techniques, they were developed in order to reduce the non-productive time. Remember, if it ain't turning, it ain't earning. So we went away from the conventional drilling techniques in order to, need to reduce MPT. And primarily this happened when I have very close proximity between the pore pressure and the fracture pressure. I encounter this most often in marine drilling, in soft sediments, but also we encounter this in land drilling. What are the cost implications of NPT? I would like to address this uh, question by utilizing uh, a slide from uh, SP Distinguished Lectures uh, series. These are costs of drilling deep, wat deep uh, water and deep wells in Gulf of Mexico. The blue triangles are the budgeted costs for the wells, and the red ones are the actual cost. Of course, you can see how much off we are in the, uh, in the budget. And on the average, the cost was around $44 million of these wells as budget. But we had about 60% cost overrun because of problems that they were encountered. I have a, a, a video on manus pressure drilling where it is explained. This is, was done by Halliburton one of the oil service companies, a very good uh, video that I would like to, to watch it together. 
Is it okay? You see it, eh? Define managed pressure drilling as a drilling optimization yeah, yeah. solution that can greatly reduce well construction costs and underbalance drilling as a reservoir enhancement solution that helps improve production. Managed pressure drilling solution allows you to drill with minimal overbalance pressure. To drill near the lowest pressure boundary, we reduce mud densities required to control the well bore. Managed pressure drilling can help you reach previously undrillable targets, eliminate casing strings, lower mud costs, reduce non-productive time associated with pressure events, and minimize formation damage while allowing precise control of the well bore. In overbalanced drilling, the well bore is open to the atmosphere and drilling fluids flow freely across the shaker to the return pit. <coughs> Managed pressure drilling solution creates a closed loop system. It is a managed environment that allows precise control of bottom hole pressure and timely detection and mitigation of kicks and mud losses. Following the model measure optimized process, every managed pressure drilling project in Halliburton starts with candidate well selection. We use detailed hydraulic models to assess the operational pressure window and the possibility of drilling with managed pressure. Pre-job modeling helps us choose the appropriate drilling fluids, select equipment configuration, and develop project procedures and contingencies. A typical managed pressure drilling system contains several key components. The rotating control device is an essential part of every MPD system that serves to divert flow away from the rig floor. It complements the rig's standard blowout preventer stack. The rotating control device forms a friction seal around the drill pipe or Kelly, and this is what creates a closed loop drilling system. Halliburton offers rotating control devices rated to static pressure of 1,000, 2,500, and 5,000 PSI. Their compact design ensures they fit under most drilling rigs without modifications or jacking, and allows for better maneuverability and faster rig up times. For high pressure wells, we deploy rotating control devices with dual stripper option that create a secondary barrier for safer operations. The choke is the pressure regulator of the managed pressure drilling system. It serves to control the well head pressure to a set point. Its opening is constantly adjusted to account for changes in flow rate through the choke to maintain the desired bottom hole pressure. Our chokes exist in various trim sizes and Halliburton specialists will select the appropriate configuration based on the detailed analysis of your reservoir conditions. Halliburton offers both manual and automatic chokes. The economical manual choke allows the rig personnel to control back pressure manually with a hydraulic control panel or using our software. The automatic choke is controlled by electronic pressure monitoring equipment. It has the speed and precision unmatched by any human choke operator. An automatic choke is your best bet when the pore pressure and fracture gradients are very close and there is little room for error. To manage wellhead pressure throughout the drilling operation, even when rig pumps are off, it is critical to maintain flow through the chokes. Typical managed pressure drilling utilizes a back pressure pump to provide fluid supply and adequate flow for maintaining the chokes. Halliburton's innovative new rig pump diverter replaces the back pressure pump. With a rig pump diverter, there is no need to stop the rig pumps during connections because this device serves to reroute the mud flow from the standpipe to the chokes. Its small footprint, ease of installation, and very modest electrical power requirements make it ideal for offshore operations. Both the back pressure pump and the flow diverter can be operated manually or in automatic mode. Once the well has reached target depth, Okay, I think I can stop it now. We are back. You see the screen, okay? The video was all right? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So, uh, from the video, what were the main elements that we operate MPD when we have narrow drilling margins? It is a closed loop system as compared to the open loop system. We have the rotating control device and the choke manifold. I can have the system automated and I can apply control. I need hydraulic modeling and I think we contributed with my lab there 
uh, until you see um, quite a bit on rheological modeling and uh, uh, drilling hydraulics. And I use sensors and I rely on their measurements. Uh, how can I, I have, ah, there it is. Okay. I can't see the, the slide title. It's well, what are the, 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 what are the MPD advantages? Do you know how can I get rid of the top thing from here? Well, anyway, MPD advantages, enhanced well control. It gives us the ability to drill previously wells that we could not drill. It allows us to use lower density mud. And if we do that, then that increases the rate of penetration. It gives us less drilling non-productive time because of the less downtime, less casing points, less stripping. This leads to less cost, but also increased safety. Now, uh, schematically, I would like to show you the theory behind the MPD technique. So this is my well, my drill pipe at the bottom, I have the bit. TVD is my true vertical uh, depth. And I have my mud pump that is pumping the fluid down and up. Now, it does happen that uh, I may have my full well uh, static, so my bottom hole pressure is the mere hydrostatic. This is the equation that I use uh, uh, with oil field units where MW is mud weight, the density. Now, when I'm drilling, I'm circulating fluid down the drill pipe and up the annulus. So my bottom hole pressure is my hydrostatic that I had plus the additional pressure that I need to overcome frictional losses as the fluid is flowing up the annulus. This extra pressure, of course, is provided by the pump. So if I put this information in my depth pressure diagram, as I do that here on the right, remember I have my two limits, my pore pressure, the red, my fracture pressure of the rock, the dotted blue line. This is my drilling window. Now, during drilling, I may have static fluid or circulating fluid. So my pressure in the well bore will be between the hydrostatic and the circulating fluid. Now, this breaks in pressure from circulating to hydrostatic happens when I stop circulating. And this happens very often when I stop and make a connection. In other words, putting uh, additional drill pipe as a drilling proceeds. Now, let's look at a real life well where I have a narrow drilling window. This is my pore pressure red line. This is my fracture pressure. The pressure in the well bore is the green line, and these are my connections. So when I stop circulating, the drilling window is narrow. So it may happen that when I stop, my pressure may go below the pore pressure. If this happens, then I have uh, influx. But if I have a high mud density, maybe I can go over the fracture pressure because it's very close to the limit. That means I may break down the formation and I have loss circulation. So under conventional conditions, this well is undrillable. Now let's see what happens when I'm drilling with MPD equipment and technique. This is my static weight, the fluid density, and you see it's below pore pressure at some points and through the modeling and the calculations that I do, I apply at the surface back pressure. We saw that in the video. I apply back pressure. So I raise the, the pressure inside the well bore 
and I can manage by playing with the back pressure, I can manage to drill through this window, which otherwise would be uncontrollable. So this is fluid density plus friction, plus back pressure. So MPD gives me greater control of bottom hole pressures. So MPD is a closed and pressurized mat system. The bottom hole pressure is the hydrostatic plus the frictional losses in the annulus, which is provided by the pump, plus the back pressure that I apply at the surface. I can adjust the back pressure at the surface and I can instantly change the bottom hole pressure. This gives me that right control that I don't have when I do convention, conventional drilling and it makes my previously undrillable wells drillable. So at any time, my bottom hole pressure is constant and is between the two limits, formation pressure and fracture pressure. How do I achieve that? So let's look at the MPD equipment. Again, conventional drilling pictures. This is the one that we've seen, the annular preventer, and this is my return line open to the atmosphere. In fact, this is the BUP stack from the Dimitra well when we went with uh, our students, and in fact, the, the Panagiotis was there as well. And with MPD, the main device that I use is, as we saw in the video, the rotating control device. I put it above the annular preventer. And if you remember, this is the capability drill pipe goes through, but the closes of the drill pipe so allows fluid to go from below or from here. So I create a closed loop system. Again, this is my open uh, flow system in conventional drilling. And let's go through this schematic uh, with MPD. This is my rotating control device and all this equipment is the additional equipment that I need to have to, to do the MPD. So in normal drilling, okay. Normal drilling from the mud, mud tanks. This is the mud pump. Mud is going into the well and is coming back to the surface. And this is the, the top open surface, the bell lip on the rig return line, and it comes back into the mud pits, shell shaker mud pits, and it's a continuous loop. Now, when I'm doing MPD, this is my rotating control device and my setup. So fluid is not going from here, but it's going through the closed loop. This is my automatic shock manifold that we heard on the video. And then it goes through a flow measuring device. And uh, for those of you familiar, this is a Coriolis flow meter that measures the flow rate through this. And then it goes through the shell shaker and into the active mud pits, and then it continues going into the well in the same way. But the return goes through the MPD equipment. Now, I can apply back pressure into the system, so I have a secondary flow system taking the mud from the mud pits. This is a secondary back pressure pump, and I can circulate fluid to apply back pressure at this point. Now, a very essential side benefit of using MPD equipment is here, that I use a device, a sensor, to measure the return flow rate, and we call it here a quick kick detection. Now, the return flow rate is a must. And in fact, I have spent a lot of time when I was in Android, uh, developing systems on this. This is again a regular system, open flow system. My mud is returning back through the uh, return line and into the shell shaker. I don't really measure the return flow rate. I, I measure what goes in, 
by looking at the map pumps, and we have some good techniques for that. But normally, we monitor what comes out. These are this is a sketch of uh, a monitoring device, and this is a, a picture of of that. I monitor changes, and it's very important to understand that when flow in, what goes in, when it comes out, then I'm doing okay, a continued drilling. But when flow in is not equal flow out, then depending on the sign, I may have a kick, influx of fluids, or a loss, loss of fluids into the formation. So it's imperative to be able to measure and compare flow in and flow out. And the best way to do that is with the minus pressure drilling techniques because I have a closed system, this is the return flow. And if you can see that, this is a Coriolis flow meter. One of the best meters that they can give us information, measurement of the return flow. How do you apply that? I hope you can see the, uh, the graph here. This is from uh, an MPD system. Uh, operation. I found this uh, presentation uh, for, from uh, near to us on offshore Egypt in water depths of 1100 meters. It was a 6,000 meter well, 1700 psi bottom pole pressure. So to the left, we see the white and the red line. The white is the flow that goes in. It's steady. The red is fluctuating is the return flow. Now, why is it fluctuating? Because I'm offshore and I have the heaves, but I can see that on the average, flow out is going along with the flow in, and I have good software tools to do this averaging. And this curve here shows me the pressure that I apply is back pressure. Now, it happened in the system that they run into a situation. This is my flow in, this is my flow out. And I do see that the flow out is diverging. Well, based on the uh, algorithms they use, they could detect kick. In this situation, in a heaving well at 1,100 meters of water depth, as low as 25 gallons, in other words, 25 gallons of kick fluid under the well bore, and they were able to detect it with NPD equipment. This is an amazing number, uh, and normally we, we are alerted when the kick is much higher. So the device that really makes the difference and allows us to apply MPD is what we, we saw, the rotating control device. This is a photo of this, and this is a cutaway view of the RCD rotating control device. This is the drill pipe, and there is, uh, we have the elastomers that they uh, close in on the pipe, and they allow, so they, they, they don't allow any fluid to go through, but uh, force the fluid to go through the side exit. How they look into uh, operation, I found these two pictures uh, from uh, semi-submersible rigs. In no APD equipment, this opening on the, on the rig floor is what they call it moon pool, and this is uh, the riser system, and in fact we can see here the uh, annular preventer on top. And then if I want to put the equipment, which is significant pieces of equipment. And one of the issues that the developers of the techniques had to deal with is how you can put this additional equipment uh, on uh, the rig, where rig space is very, very limited, where they managed to put it. And here they have the RCD, and then the chalk manifold, they put it on the skid and it's near, nearby. So we have the techniques to put it. Now I have two variants of MPD, a reactive and proactive. Reactive, I drill the well conventionally. I have MPD equipment installed and it's energized only when necessary. 
And then I have the proactive. I have the PD equipment from the beginning, but I'm using it from the start. And I adapt to well condition as drilling progresses. One may ask, well, if I have my NPD equipment on board, why I'm not using it? So why I should be on the reactive mode? But well, one of the answers is because people and drillers and uh, rig personnel are familiar with the conventional way of drilling. So when things go well, they go conventionally. But if things get tough, then they will energize MPD equipment. That's one of the explanations. So what do I do to proceed with the MPD installation? I define and establish the purpose for MPD. I procure information. I do a very good hydraulic analysis. Because remember, all depends on the pressures in the wellbore. I select a method. We have different techniques, as we will see. Well, I do a viability of MPD. I recommend the equipment and I do a hazard analysis. So how do I select whether my well is uh, suitable for MPD? Well, we have devised uh, selection flow diagrams where we do, as you can see here, I start, I perform hydraulic analysis, then through a series of questions and yes and no answers, I go through the analysis and I may end up that MPD is not required, is not useful, is applicable. So I do go through this series of uh, questions to finally decide whether my well is uh, amenable to MPD. I have different techniques for MBD. Here I show the five techniques. Is the cost and bottom hole variation, which is the most common one, and we discussed it already, application of surface back pressure. I have pressurized mud cap, and it's interesting. This is the one that uh, Panagiotis uh, worked on when he went to, to England. Uh, for a, an Erasmus, and he produced a, a very good paper, and he put it also in his uh, thesis. Uh, good to look at uh, his diploma thesis that is available at EUC. Then we have dual gradient drilling, and we have low rise return system and closed system. I will say a few more uh, words on the first three techniques. This is another way of looking at it, MPD techniques, the five ones that we discuss, and everyone can have different type of applications. Now, who, which one is used the most? Well, uh, I managed to find some information in uh, 2000, from 2020, about 50% of the application is on cost and bottom for pressure, about 34% pressurized mud cap drilling and around 17% on dual gradient drilling. Now, how do I select the method? The method, it depends on the hydraulic analysis, the conditions and constraints of the rig, the equipment, the operator and regulatory agencies, availability of equipment and appropriate personnel because it's outside the conventional drilling. So I need to have very good training of my personnel. So let's look briefly at the three of the techniques I presented. So cost and bottom hole pressure. Here, the driller closes the returns choke and applies hydraulic pressure to achieve cost and bottom hole pressure uh, as he drills. Closing the chunk when the mud pumps are stopped to make a pipe, to make a connection, allows the driller to maintain the constant pressure downhole using the back pressure. We may have the circulation system as we saw to allow for pressure control when making connections. Now, this is a schematic of the equipment that we pretty much saw it. This is the BOP stack and the regular equipment, rig choke manifold, but this is my rotating control device. 
NPD shock manifold, the flow of bitter, and then it taps into the regular uh, rig uh, equipment. And we've seen this diagram again before in more detail when, how to apply cost and back pressure, my rotating control head, my shock manifold, my flow meter. But I would like to show you here a, a, an example. I was from the well drilling in Wyoming. It was presented in 2018 of a well that it would be undrillable otherwise. So this is an actual well depth versus pressure diagram. My pore pressure with the blue line, my flexion pressure, the uh, purple line. Now my static borehole pressure is the green line and the dotted line represents the dynamic pressure when I'm circulating. So he, my target depth is here. So based on this well, the actual, uh, the actual well, at this depth, before my target depth, I will run into problem because my static pressure will go below the pore pressure. But when I'm running and circulating at this depth, I will run into a low circulation because I will go above fracture pressure. So when they did their analysis and they decided to go with the uh, MPD equipment, again, this is a land rig. So the red line represents the static pressure in the wellbore and the dotted red line is the uh, pressure when circulating. So how they achieve that, they use mud densities of lower density than this green representation and applying the back pressure. So they managed to drill the well, which otherwise would be undrillable. Now, let's look at the pressurized mud cup drilling technique. It is designed specifically to get through fracture formations. When I have uh, big voids and I lose a lot of fluid into the, into the formation, and that can be very dangerous for the safety of the well. So for this type, I have a predetermined column height of a particular mud density that I pump it not in the drill pipe, but in the annulus. And I have a mud cap which serves as a barrier to returns to the surface. I don't return to the surface. Then I use what I call a sacrificial mud. For most of the time, I use seawater, but I use it for drilling. The fluid and the cuttings are forced into the zone that we lose uh, the fluid. Now, schematically, how do I achieve that? This is the particular well. This is a zone that I have these fractures. And if I would drill conventionally, my fluid would be going there and I would have severe uh, losses. So what do I do? First, I pump into the annulus a fluid, a drilling fluid with a particular density that I, that I decide to serve as the mud cap. It's not a continuous addition. Periodically, I may add. And then I pump through my drill pipe what we call the sacrificial fluid, which could be the seawater. So this goes down, it takes the cuttings, and then as it returns up in the annulus, it will be forced into this low zone. So I don't have any returns because I have this markup. And the equipment that I use is pretty much the same. The difference is the type of fluids and where I inject my fluids. Good to see the pressure depth diagram in a mud cup drilling application. So this is TVD, this is my pressure. If I were to drill the particular well with a single fluid, that would be the, uh, the pressure profile in the well bone. I'm going to the bottom hole pressure. Indicate here, this would be the zone, the low zone. So on top, I put a high density fluid. This is my hydrostatic. And I, apply, I can apply also back pressure. 
Then on the, from bottom hole to the low zone, I have my pressure, which is the hydrostatic pressure from the sacrificial fluid. Now, the limitations of this technique, of course, it requires a subsurface zone that can take the cuttings and the drilling fluid. I need to have large reserves of sacrificial fluids. That's why we uh, use uh, uh, seawater when we drill offshore and sufficient quantities of mudcap fluid. Then, of course, we need to comply with regulations and the logistics. And we need to have the specialized and trained people. Finally, I will discuss the dual gradient drilling. And this is really a technique, a marvelous and ingenious, I call it, uh, uh, manus pressure drilling technique that it is in place. Now, when I, and I apply that uh, primarily in uh, offshore, in deep water offshore. So at the beginning, but also when I'm at the, at the very start of drilling, this is my rig. I have my drill pipe and I drill uh, just a very short uh, section. And during that time, I don't have any uh, protective equipment, any BOPs installed because it's at the very beginning. So the mud that I pump in, which is primarily seawater, with the cuttings is returned and is left on, uh, on the seabed. Then when I go deeper, I put my BOP stack, and then I have a large pipe that is called the marine riser connecting the BOP to the, uh, to the rig. Through this pipe, I have my drill pipe and the mud is returning with the cuttings to the surface. So the people have thought, well, why I should do that and not take the mud return right after the BOP, put a subsea pump, and pump the fluid with a different pipe on top. This way, the formations that I have down hole here, they sense the pressure from the mud that is returning in the annulus, but above here is only seawater. Otherwise, it would have also the mud column. So I have two mud gradients, a seawater gradient and a mud gradient. So dual gradient drilling refers to drilling where mud returns do not go through a conventional rush diameter drilling riser. Instead, the returns move from the seafloor to the surface through one or more small diameter pipes. I use a mud lift system and I need to use a drill string valve just above the, the drill bit in order to take care of the imbalance operations when the system goes uh, static. I'll show you this example schematically in terms of hydraulics. So I'm really here in 10,000 feet of water depth, 3,000 meters. That's pretty much what we expect to drill. May, they may dr be drilling. Offshore grid, we'll see. So conventional drilling. I have my drill pipe, my bit, top, true vertical depth 22,355 feet. And then I have my marine riser. So mud goes down and returns all the way to the surface, to the rig, through the marine riser. So what is the pressure at the, we call it the mud line, the seabed? is 7,020 PSI if I drill with 13.5 PPG mud weight, pounds per gallon. If you are unfamiliar with the unit, uh, water is 8.3 PPG. So my pressure here, hydrostatic pressure from the annuals because I have mud of 13 PPG is 7,000 PSI. Now, when I do do a gradient drilling, Remember, we said above the BOP, I take the fluid out, I use the pump, and I use a different fluid, a different pipe. So above here, I have the seawater, and here I have drilling fluid. Now, I want to have the same pressure at the bottom hole. 
If I calculate the bottom hole pressure for this situation is 15,600 PSI. Now, here I have two densities, hence dual gradient. My pressure at the mud line is 4450 PSI, much less than this because I have seawater. It's a bit more than water compared to the 13.5 PPG. This allows me to use a much heavier fluid here where I'm drilling 70. And in order to have the same pressure, I can use up to 17.5 PPG mud weight. How does it look in a pressure depth diagram? Single gradient, normal drilling. This is my red dotted line. I go from top. I saw the example 13.5 PPG. Bottom hole pressure at this depth is almost 16,000 PSI. In order to achieve the same pressure, I have the seawater above, and then here I can use 17.5 ppg mud. Uh, interesting to know that at every depth when I'm drilling, my pressure is less than the pressure if I were to drill conventionally. Why? Because I took out all this mud column, and I'm using, of course, a mud lift pump as additional equipment, but we can do that. And people have done that. Uh, one of the very first applications was back in 2011 in Brazil, in very shallow waters, around 35 to 70 meters. This was the sketch of the equipment that they used, the subsea pump, the return line, and it worked. And full-blown application was done in 2012 in Gulf of Mexico. That's where everything new starts, really, because they've been drilling for many, many years, and they try different things. And when they try and they prove them there, then they come to the other places in the world. In fact, this was an ingenious dual gradient technique that is shown schematically here. And it was very successful. And I would like to share that with you with the video from the EC drill system that they used. It's about two minutes video, and I would like to watch it together. Welcome to Enhanced Drilling's video animation of the EC drill controlled mud level technology. EC drill enables operators to navigate through narrow pressure windows by controlling the level of drilling fluid in the riser. This animation showcases how Easy Drill controls bottle hole pressure and compensates for ECD, enabling drilling of the undrillable well. By controlling the drilling fluid, Easy Drill can quickly reduce the bottle hole pressure if sudden losses to the formation occur. If a depleted zone or a natural fracture is drilled into, the bottle hole pressure can be reduced to below the fracture pressure within minutes. Drilling can safely continue without losses to the formation. Easy drill is also utilized for managed pressure cementing, where the drilling fluid level is adjusted during cementing operations to maintain cementing ECD below fracture pressure. Managed pressure cementing is a unique tool that can compensate for the ECD increase from the heavier cement densities during displacement as well as maintaining overbalanced pressure during setting. Easy drill ensures the cementing objectives are achieved while simplifying the cement design and avoiding the use of costly, lightweight cements. Easy drill is finely tuned to detect influxes and kicks. Operators are able to detect and react quicker to influxes than with conventional methods. If an overpressure zone is encountered, the drilling fluid can be quickly raised to increase the bottom hole pressure to achieve overbalance pressure, the drilling fluid level can continuously be adjusted so the bottom hole pressure stays within a narrow drilling window as drilling continues to the planned depths. Okay. We must. Uh, let me go on it. All right. We are back. Yeah, I think. That's the genius thing 
So it's the back pressure that we talked and uh, they apply, they applied it hydraulically. It's very, very interesting. And I, I hope and I expect that this technique is uh, used more and more. Now, one excellent benefit that we, we can have utilizing MPD equipment and techniques is that we can automate. We can control and automate the system. And I would like to take this particular example uh, from a land rig that uh, they managed to drill through an extremely narrow window. This is the green line, the pore pressure. Oh, Somebody is running something. I see three lines here. Okay. And then the fracture pressure is the red dotted line. 21.4 ppg, 20.9 ppg. The window is only 0.5 ppg. And they managed to drill through this. This is the well bore pressure. Uh, very well. They had huge losses in offset wells. They still had some losses, 5 to 15 barrels per hour. But they managed to do that with uh, uh, automating the system. So what is the MPD penetration? I managed to find some information back in 2020, looking at deep water MPD rigs, about 16% of the rig fleet in 2020 had MPD equipment. Cost of MPD equipment, uh, I don't have a figure to show you here, but based on what I have heard, it would cost around 30 to $35 million to, to, to have that equipment on the semi-submersibles and the drill ships. But how much does it cost to run the MPD? I found that number is about a million US dollars per month they charge on world average, uh, which is approximately 30, 35,000 dollars per day. Now, nowadays, how much they charge to drill uh, a deep water well? Uh, they are running about 250 to up to $400,000 per day. So this is a small fraction of the cost. But it's most value in exploratory wells where we don't know the pressures or when we drill development wells, but we still don't have good information about the downhole pressures. And I found this information that's very recent, uh, February 2020, how much Transocean, the biggest offshore rig operator, uh, charging about $40,000 per day for MPD services. What is the size of the MPD market? Back in 2018, it was around $3.5 billion, expected to reach around $5 billion by 2026. So it was growing at about 4.6% annual growth rate. And that's another slide about the uh, MPD drilling market size. But for North America, the study was done in 2018. The market size was $1.1 billion, expected to reach to double to $2 billion by 2025. So this is a what I may call it now mature technology that is catching up uh, and uh, we do see more and more MPD equipment on the uh, offshore rigs. So the questions are, what will be the, the, the future of offshore drilling? How deep the waters you will have to go? Currently we go around 3,700 meters of water. How deep the wells? Is there a depth limit for either? That's a big question. I think many people can have some difficulty answering. And when would the ring stand? Well, we may see a ring standing on the seabed. This is an application in 2003 where they tried a ring, they put it on the seabed and they drilled uh, some meters 
on the seabed. In fact, in 2014, in Germany, they developed the MEBO 200, capable of operating to 4,000 meters of water, and they managed to cut 200 meter long course from the seabed. And since 2016, it is successfully in operation. And of course, our dear friends, the Chinese, whenever they see something very important and interesting, they go full speed ahead and they develop their own rig that stands on the seabed and they uh, presented it in April 2021, last year. This is a picture of that capable of operating in 2000 meters of water and they managed to get 230 meters of core on the seabed. Whether it will manage to see uh, rigs that they can go to a few thousand meters, that remains to be seen. And maybe you youngsters will be able to develop the technology to do that. But this could be the target. Put the rig on the sea so that we can get rid of the seawater, which causes us as big problems in drilling safety the wells, safely the wells. So in conclusion, and a brief summary, we have good tools for successfully drilling, very difficult to drill wells. We need some good operators, and I hope you youngsters find good jobs uh, working in innovative drilling techniques. And of course, we will end up with formula for success. Rise early, work hard, strike oil. But we should always remember that whoever searches finds, and if we don't dig, if we don't make a hole in the ground, we will never find. And in closing, I would put this picture of the uh, blocks, uh, offshore Crete and offshore uh, in Ionian Sea, I was from a map in September 2018. And they keep on talking about, yes, you will be drilling, yes, you will be drilling, but we are still discussing. These are the information from the Greek newspapers 2017-18. They signed in June 2019, these two blocks. And we are here in 2022, and they are still discussing. I hope the discussions will be over, and soon we will see a semi-submersible or a drill ship to drill and try to find uh, hydrocarbon resources in offshore Greek deep waters. I would like to thank you very much for your attention, and it's time for questions now. Thank you very much, Professor Kelesidis, for this uh, highly interesting presentation. Uh, I'm not seeing uh, many questions in the chat, so I would suggest that we raise hands if there are any questions uh, among the audience. So if you like, raise hands. So, okay, I would like to ask, uh, how does the blowout that we seen we that we saw in the beginning how does it catch fire yeah that's a very very good uh, uh, question well again we are searching for hydrocarbons and hydrocarbons are ignitable yes. so if we don't manage to to control it and they come to surface to the rig floor uncontrollably, then they need a, an ignition source in order to catch fire. Now, the, the industry has developed techniques and the instrumentation that we use on the rig floor, being a land rig or a offshore rig, has requirements so that when you have short circuit, it doesn't, it doesn't cause a spark 
because the spark is the one that will ignite primarily uh, the, the hydrocarbon gases mainly. But uh, uh, accidents happened. And despite the, the, the very, very strict regulations that the industry has about uh, not allowing equipment to cause sparks, apparently they happen and uh, we, we have the, the fire. For example, in the Makoto accident, uh, there have been thousands of pages written. People have tried to explain what happened. Uh, I, I went through a lot of them, but I haven't found uh, any information that explain how it caught fire. The one of the key uh, elements in the analysis of the failures was that the system that would not allow ignition of, of hydrocarbon gases failed. So the, there is a, there was a system there, but it failed. The how it failed uh, for this particular situation uh, is not easy. And of course, you can. Uh, we realize that in a in time of fire, almost everything is destroyed. So any evidence we may have had about the, uh, the equipment that would deter the ignition of fire normally is lost. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. So I don't see any questions, unfortunately. Uh, I would like to thank you once again for this presentation. And thanks. thank you very much for being with me. And thank you everyone for attending. Uh, wishing you happy holidays, happy Easter, and a good continuation with your studies. And whatever thank you, you very do. much. Thank you very Yeah, ευχαριστούμε. Γεια χαρά. Ευχαριστούμε.